Um, I've been quite to uplifted part of this morning uh, with all the young people who tell me there's a great future and chatted into a couple of people talking of investing several million quid. Um, uh, hope wisely. Um, and that, that's good, but I do realise um, massive pressures on both sectors, uh, uh, particularly through the fee um, uh, issue. But it's not just the fee issue, I realise that, it's the uh, import issue, it's the labelling, <coughs> it's um, the promotion as well. Um, DEFRA can't uh, turn the clock back, uh, it would be wrong if we could, but uh, we're there, I suppose as a regulator, we're a department that spends most of the time regulating, most of our regulations start in Brussels. Uh, our objective, I know it's we're not believed, is to regulate <coughs> as little as possible, and indeed we have a target for getting rid of regulations each year, but there's always more coming down the uh, conveyor belt from, from Brussels, so we have to run fast to stand still. But it's not in our interest to over-regulate the uh, sectors and put people uh, out of business. So we have to take on board. And these much early warnings we get from the industry about new regulations or ideas for regulation on Brussels so that we can negotiate things that suit Great Britain or the UK as the case may be, um, the, the better it is for everybody concerned. The consumer is entitled to discriminate, but they can only do that on the basis of information they get on the label and the production. So, you know, I'm not, you know, people say, oh, you want more information on labels to discriminate against us in the third one. I don't. The customer is entitled to discriminate. The, uh, the imports we receive, but we're a trading nation. We have a huge export trade. Um, I don't carry the current figures around in my head, but I know that in uh, early last year when we saw the figures, our exports of food and drink were at record levels. Now, when we are in that position, our exports, our exports, if we drink are at record levels, we are playing a dangerous game if we are thought to be going down the road of, um, uh, of tariffs and protectionism, and I'm not implying the industry is. But it's very important there's two sides of the same coin here. We want a level playing field for exports, but we want a leveler playing field uh, for our imports. Because the word cage just sums up all the images that are all wrong. So we get rid of all the battery cages, the next campaign will be to get rid of the cages. You know, and they're completely they're chalk and cheese. I can see, you know, I've seen uh, uh, battery cages, and what I've just seen out there is nothing remotely like them. Battery cages, but I've never actually seen it in this case, so I've quite got the opportunity. If the science says, both our science and uh, collaborators in the European Union actually come round to saying that uh, meat and bone meal uh, from um, uh, cattle can be fed as part of the uh, food supplement to uh, non-cattle uh, species, then I don't think you can go against that. Because on public health grounds, food safety grounds, you've got to go with the science, because it's the science you use to stop people doing things. Now, when the science allows you to do things, then you should allow the things to happen because of the science. And the idea to say, well, we've got a ban on this feeding, that must remain forever. Uh, if the science changes, and the science changes because there's more knowledge, then I think we have to go with it. I just think it's a step too far. Uh, and I think uh, I can make a case for that. Uh, I've no doubt, even inside DEFRA, there might be others want to make the case the other way. But the fact of the matter is, um, we've got to sometimes let go and just resist the temptation to regulate on what can look like a good idea. So, I mean, all the regulations start off as a very seductive idea. They're all, you know, everyone agrees, oh, that's a good idea, this is, it's worth doing it, that. But they do change as they uh, come through the system and can cause us real difficulties. So my view still remains the same. But there is a prize for us in getting this round organised. Because, I mean, actually success in Doha would mean, by definition, that the Americans have had to give on a few things. Because otherwise there isn't going to be a Doha round. It's as simple as that. <coughs> so um, th there's a benefit to trade overall. There is no doubt about that, the overall package. <coughs> but uh, you're quite right. Um, I'm not in favour of our, any of our sectors being uh, sold in the river. So if we can keep the, uh, the designation and go for the designation, I I'm all for it. But what I can't predict at the moment is the actual outcome of that final few hours of negotiation. We've been pressing. Um, so far unsuccessfully to try and get welfare actually included in the WTO discussions. In order to get a fair return you depress production 
as you say, below demand, to get the price back up again. And in the meantime, you've lost capacity. Um, that suits nobody, uh, and it is most un unfortunate. But I can't wait for a magic wand over that. I, I think this issue of, if you like, of, uh, of playing the market in as, as tough and as robust a fashion as possible is absolutely uh, crucial. We tried to turn it around, as you appreciate, we asked um, the kindly offices of the NFU to work with the Environment Agency to see if we could find some way of, of burying IPPC, if you like, or embedding it, as more than correct phrase, into the Farm Assurance uh, Red Tractor Programme, really, uh, basically cut down on costs. You know, why do the same thing twice? Now, I have to say, initially, the idea was not well received in the Environment Agency, that we'd asked a trade organisation to get involved in trying to sort out regulation. So it didn't go down too well. Um, I haven't myself had the final outcome of those discussions, but it hasn't um, uh, been a uh, rip-roaring success of trying to reduce costs. However, progress has been made, and I understand there is the possibility of being able to get some of the IPPC embedded into farm assurance. How much that will help cut the costs, I'm not, I'm not certain uh, about that. Um, it's, it's one way, which is one of the reasons why I don't want it to go, I believe seem to be, um, you know, that if we could have got in earlier, we could have got a more uh, industry-friendly uh, operation of RPPC. I'm just horrified at what you say about what the cost is. Um, on the chlorated chicken, no. Uh, this is my personal view. I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. I wouldn't allow it in the country. My personal view is up to me, but it isn't up to me in that sense. Um, it's certainly got to be labelled chlorine chicken. Um, which got to be. Come on. I mean, I want the label to tell the truth. I want the method of slaughter. I want to know it's well for. It's chlorine chicken. It's CC from the US of A. <laughs> and, um, you know, and you're a customer, it's a free country, you can buy it if you want. I mean, that's what. So, I mean, to be honest, it's a way of hiding defects in their breeding, their slaughter. Uh, it is a way of doing that, there's no question about that. And they might, and at the end of the day, the Food Standards Agency and others might say it's perfectly safe to eat. Well, it's perfectly safe to eat as long as it's labelled. Chlorine chicken. <laughs> and they, the Americans are, are not going to be allowed to say, you're discriminating against our technology by insisting that's on the label. Well, the customer is the one that discriminates, but they can only do it on intelligent knowledge of the label. I mean, I think it's appalling, uh, the idea. I can see why they want to do it, but to be honest, you're cutting all kinds of, um, you know, safety corners. Uh, and I just, makes my sort of flesh creep.